Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Whole Bible Deuteronomy 9 The design of Moses in this chapter is to convince the people of Israel of their utter unworthiness to receive from God those great favors that were now to be conferred upon them, writing this, as it were, in capital letters at the head of their charter, not for your sake, be it known unto you, Ezekiel 36 verse 32. 1. He assures them of victory over their enemies, verses 1 to 3. 2. He cautions them not to attribute their successes to their own merit, but to God's justice, which was engaged against their enemies, and his faithfulness, which was engaged to their fathers, verses 4 to 6. 3. To make it evident, evident that they had no reason to boast of their own righteousness, he mentions their faults, shows Israel their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. In general, they had been all along a provoking people, verses 7 to 24. In particular, 1. In the matter of the golden calf, the story of which he largely relates, verses 8 to 21. 2. He mentions some other instances of their rebellion, verses 22 and 23. And, 3. Returns, at verse 25, to speak of the intercession he had made for them at Horeb, to prevent their being ruined for the golden calf. Victory promised, 1451 BC. 1 Here, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go and to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven, to a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak. 3 Understand therefore this day, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee, as a consuming fire he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face, so shalt thou drive them out, and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. For speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Five not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 6. Understand therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. The call to attention, verse 1, here, O Israel, intimates that this was a new discourse delivered at some distance of time after the former, probably the next Sabbath day. 1. Moses represents to the people the formidable strength of the enemies which they were now to encounter, verse 1. The nations they were to dispossess were mightier than themselves, not a rude and undisciplined rout, like the natives of America, that were easily made a prey of. But, should they besiege them, they would find their cities well fortified, according as the art of fortification then was, should they engage them in the field, they would find the people great and tall, of whom common fame had reported that there was no standing before them. Verse 2. This representation is much the same with that which the evil spies had made, Numbers 13 verses 28 and 33, but made with a very different intention, that was designed to drive them from God and to discourage their hope in Him, this to drive them to God and to engage their hope in Him, since no power less than that which is Almighty could secure and prosper them. 2. He assures them of victory by the presence of God with them, notwithstanding the strength of the enemy. Verse 3. Understand therefore, therefore what thou must trust to for success, and which way thou must look, it is the Lord thy God that goes before thee, not only as thy captain, or commander-in-chief, to give direction, but as a consuming fire, to do execution among them. Observe, he shall destroy them, and then thou shalt drive them out. Thou canst not drive them out, unless he destroy them, and bring them down. But he will not destroy them and bring them down, unless thou set thyself in good earnest to drive them out. We must do our endeavor in dependence upon God's grace, and we shall have that grace if we do our endeavor. 3. He cautions them not to entertain the least thought of their own righteousness, as if that had procured them this favor at God's hand, say not. For my righteousness, either with regard to my good character or in recompense for any good service, the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, verse 4, never think it is for thy righteousness or the uprightness of thy heart, that it is in consideration either of thy good conversation or of thy good disposition, verse 5. And again, verse 6, it is insisted on, because it is hard to bring people from a conceit of their own merit, 
and yet very necessary that it be done, understand, know it, and believe it, and consider it, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this land for thy righteousness. Hadst thou been to come to it upon that condition, thou wouldst have been forever shut out of it, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Note, our gaining possession of the heavenly Canaan, as it must be attributed to God's power and not to our own might, so it must be ascribed to God's grace and not to our own merit, in Christ we have both righteousness and strength, in him therefore we must glory, and not in ourselves, or any sufficiency of our own. For, he intimates to them the true reasons why God would take this good land out of the hands of the Canaanites, and settle it upon Israel, and they are borrowed from his own honor, not from Israel's deserts. 1. He will be honored in the destruction of idolaters, they are justly looked upon as haters of him, and therefore he will visit their iniquity upon them. It is for the wickedness of these nations that God drives them out, verse 4, and again, verse 5. All those whom God rejects are rejected for their own wickedness, but none of those whom he accepts are accepted for their own righteousness. 2. 2. He will be honored in the performance of his promise to those that are in covenant with him. God swore to the patriarchs, who loved him and left all to follow him, that he would give this land to their seed, and therefore he would keep that promised mercy for thousands of those that loved him and kept his commandments, he would not suffer his promise to fail. It was for their fathers' sakes that they were beloved, Romans 11 verse 28. Thus boasting is forever excluded. See Ephesians 1 verses 9 and 11. Cautions against self-righteousness, Israel reminded of their rebellions, 1451 BC. 7 Remember, and forget not, how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness, from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt, until ye came unto this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. 8 Also in Horeb ye provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. 9 When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights, I neither did eat bread nor drink water, 10 And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words, which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. 11 And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights, that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. 12 And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence, for thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves, they are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them, they have made them a molten image. 13 Furthermore the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and, behold, it is a stiff-necked people. 14 Let me alone, that I may destroy them, and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. 15 So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. 16 And I looked, and, behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf, ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. 17 And I took the two tables, and cast them out of my two hands, and break them before your eyes. 18 And I fell down before the Lord, as at the first, forty days and forty nights, I did neither eat bread, nor drink water, because of all your sins which ye sinned, in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. 19 For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure, wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. 20 And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him, and I prayed for Aaron also the same time. 21 And I took your sin, the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust, and I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. 22 And at Tabra, and at Massa, and at Kibroth Hadavava, ye provoked the Lord to wrath. 23 Likewise when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. 24 Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. 25 Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. 26 I prayed therefore unto the Lord, and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people, and thine inheritance, 
which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Hand. 27 Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. 28 Lest the land whence thou broughtest us out say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. 29 Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. That they might have no pretense to think that God brought them to Canaan for their righteousness, Moses here shows them what a miracle of mercy it was that they had not long ere this been destroyed in the wilderness. Remember, and forget not, how thou provokest the Lord thy God. Verse 7 so far from purchasing his favor, thou hast many a time laid thyself open to his displeasure. Their fathers' provocations are here charged upon them, for, if God had dealt with their fathers according to their deserts, this generation would never have been, much less would they have entered Canaan. We are apt to forget our provocations, especially when the smart of the rod is over, and have need to be often put in mind of them, that we may never entertain any conceit of our own righteousness. Paul argues from the guilt which all mankind is under to prove that we cannot be justified before God by our own works, Romans 3 verses 19 and 20. If our works condemn us, they will not justify us. Observe, 1. They had been a provoking people ever since they came out of Egypt, verse 7. Forty years long, from first to last, were God and Moses grieved with them. It is a very sad character Moses now at parting leaves of them, you have been rebellious since the day I knew you, verse 24. No sooner were they formed into a people than there was a faction formed among them, which upon all occasions made head against God and his government. Though the Mosaic history records little more than the occurrences of the first and last year of the forty, yet it seems by this general account that the rest of the years were not much better, but one continued provocation. 2. Even in Horeb they made a calf and worshipped it, verse 8, etc. That was a sin so heinous, and by several aggravations made so exceedingly sinful, that they deserved upon all occasions to be upbraided with it. It was done in the very place where the law was given by which they were expressly forbidden to worship God by images, and while the mountain was yet burning before their eyes, and Moses had gone up to fetch them the law in writing. They turned aside quickly, verse 16. 3. God was very angry with them for their sin. Let them not think that God overlooked what they did amiss, and gave them Canaan for what was good among them. No, God had determined to destroy them, verse 8, could easily have done it, and would have been no loser by it, he even desired Moses to let him alone that he might do it, verses 13 and 14. By this it appeared how heinous their sin was, for God is never angry with any above what there is cause for, as men often are. Moses himself, though a friend and favorite, trembled at the revelation of God's wrath from heaven against their ungodliness and unrighteousness, verse 19, I was afraid of the anger of the Lord, afraid perhaps not for them only, but for himself, Psalm 119 verse 120. 4. They had by their sin broken covenant with God and forfeited all the privileges of the covenant, which Moses signified to them by breaking the tables, verse 17. A bill of divorce was given them and thenceforward they might justly have been abandoned forever, so that their mouth was certainly stopped from pleading any righteousness of their own. God had, in effect, disowned them, when he said to Moses, verse 12, They are thy people, they are none of mine, nor shall they be dealt with as mine. 5. Aaron himself fell under God's displeasure for it, though he was the saint of the Lord, and was only brought by surprise or terror to be confederate with them in the sin. The Lord was very angry with Aaron, verse 20. No man's place or character can shelter him from the wrath of God if he have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Aaron, that should have made atonement for them if the iniquity could have been purged away by sacrifice and offering, did himself fall under the wrath of God, so little did they consider what they did when they drew him in. 6. It was with great difficulty and very long attendance that Moses himself prevailed to turn away the wrath of God and prevent their utter ruin. He fasted and prayed full forty days and forty nights before he could obtain their pardon, verse 18. And some think twice forty days, verse 25, because it is said, As I fell down before, whereas his, his errand in the first forty was not of that nature. Others think it was but one forty, though twice mentioned, as also in chapter 10 verse 10, 
but this was enough to make them sensible how great God's displeasure was against them and what a narrow escape they had for their lives. And in this appears the greatness of God's anger against all mankind that no less a person than his son, and no less a price than his own blood, would serve to turn it away. Moses here tells them the substance of his intercession for them. He was obliged to own their stubbornness, and their wickedness, and their sin, verse 27. Their character was bad indeed when he that appeared an advocate for them could not give them a good word, and had nothing else to say in their behalf, but that God had done great things for them, which really did but aggravate their crime, verse 26, that they were the posterity of good ancestors, verse 27, which might also have been turned upon him, as making the matter worse and not better, and that the Egyptians would reproach God, if he should destroy them, as unable to perfect what he had. Wrought for them, verse 28, a plea which might easily enough have been answered, no matter what the Egyptians say, while the heavens declare God's righteousness, so that the saving of them from ruin at that time was owing purely to the mercy of God, and the importunity of Moses, and not to any merit of theirs, that could be offered so much as in mitigation of their offense. 7. He calls it their sin, perhaps not only because it had been the matter of their sin, but because the destroying of it was intended for a testimony against their sin, and an indication to them what the sinners themselves did deserve. Those that made it were like unto it, and would have had no wrong done them if they had been thus stamped to dust, and consumed, and scattered, and no remains of them left. It was infinite mercy that accepted the destruction of the idol instead of the destruction of the idolaters. 8. Even after this fair escape that they had, in many other instances they provoked the Lord again and again. He needed only to name the places, for they carried the memorials either of the sin or of the punishment in their names, verse 22 at Tabra, burning, where God, God set fire to them for their murmuring, at Massa, the temptation, where they challenged Almighty Power to help them, and at Kybroth Hadavava, the graves of lusters, where the dainties they coveted were their poison, and, after these, their unbelief and distrust at Kadesh Barnea, of which he had already told them, chapter 1, and which he here mentions again, verse 23 would certainly have completed their ruin if they had been dealt with according to their own merits. Now let them lay all this together, and it will appear that whatever favor God should hereafter show them, in subduing their enemies and putting them in possession of the land of Canaan, it was not for their righteousness. It is good for us often to remember against ourselves, with sorrow and shame, our former sins, and to review the records conscience keeps of them, that we may see how much we are indebted to free grace, and may humbly own that we never merited at God's hand anything but wrath and the curse.